So what would you do? Your spouse that you love dearly becomes emotionally and sexually involved with someone else. It almost destroys your marriage because of the great, deep, intense emotion that your spouse felt for this other person. But finally, because of the fact that you fought for your marriage, he or she decides to work out things and comes home. Things go well. As a matter of fact, a lot of things much better than they were before the affair occurred. But your spouse does not change his or her cell phone number, does not change anything about social media, and you're wondering, is there still something going on? It worries you. Does that really happen? Absolutely. Hi, I'm Dr. Joe Beam. Welcome to Marriage Radio. It's part of what we do at Marriage Helper. You can find out about us at marriagehelper.com. Let me play for you parts of a call from a lady, and she's talking about the very situation I just described and let's see if there's some good answers for her. Well, I'd like to thank you for all the help that you give us and for introducing me to limerence. In all honesty, if I didn't know about limerence, my marriage would have been over a long time ago. Knowledge is power. As we think about what she just said, she mentioned a word called limerence. If you've listened to our program before, you know that limerence is the word used in the social sciences to describe being, quote, madly in love, end quote, with another person. We do have a lot about it on our website. If you go to marriagehelper.com, you can read articles there. You can also find many podcasts that we have done on the subject, and you can listen to all of those. But may I give you one warning if you do? She said that knowledge is power, and that's true. And learning about limerence can be extremely effective for you. But if you think that your spouse is emotionally and or sexually involved with another person, after you listen to what we have to say about limerence in our various podcasts or when you read about it on our website, you'll be tempted to take that information directly to your spouse to try to explain to him or her exactly what's going on, what they're doing, why they're feeling what they're feeling. And while knowledge is power, may I suggest that you do not do that. (laughs) Why? Because they will listen to what you have to say, and what they feel is so intense that in, I guess, probably 90 cases out of 100, they're going to tell you that you're absolutely wrong, and that's not descriptive of what they're feeling. So while we have all kinds of information on our website and other places about limerence that'll help you understand what this lady just described, when you do, don't become the educator for your spouse. It will work against you. I think I can better explain by sharing more with you of the questions that the lady asked and finding an answer to what do you do when your spouse is supposedly reconciling but may possibly still be involved with the other person. Anyway, um, three stages you said is right on track, except that my husband vacillated all throughout. Yeah, it's kind of different, but the changes are amazing. It's really good. Um, He has come home early now and is, and most especially be the greatest dad and it's amazing he has catapulted the careers of my children to heights I never even imagined because of his support and and sacrifice with them and he has become my son's best friend but uh, lately we've always been trying he always gives me false hope but lately we've really been trying except that he doesn't talk about it His action speaks louder than words, and I would take that if that's what he could give now. But I asked him for a change of number and a Facebook, but he wouldn't do it. And so I feel that he's not 100%, although we understand each other now, and we don't, although we don't talk about it, um, which makes me vacillate. He's not vacillating. I'm the one vacillating more, obviously more. And I push him away when I am triggered, and I explain to him, but he still wouldn't be 100 percent which someone told me it could be pride it could be ego just let it be for now so okay but lately i found out that he is at it again he didn't he didn't acknowledge but we go back to blame shifting and ambivalence and all that stuff and justification but he's nice still nice he's the one reaching out starting conversations but i'm not saying anything anymore because i told him you know what if you can't give 100 percent then I'm just going to save me. Too tired of saving you in our marriage. So 
question. I'm really worried that it's going to go back to stage two because we've gone this far. And I trust that those times we were, when we were together, we were, it would leave a mark on him, hopefully. Let me just interrupt her here to explain a couple of things, if I may. She made reference to stage two. And if you've not heard me talk about limerence before, let me give a very quick explanation of the three stages. Stage one is what we call infatuation, and that's when a person first begins to become involved with another person in a deep and emotional level. Now, in the situation we're talking about, this man is married to one woman, and he's becoming emotionally involved with the other. You may have noticed that the caller said that during that period, he vacillated. Not unusual at all for people in stage one, because they are married to one and developing a relationship with another, and often the vacillation occurs because they feel guilty, like, what am I doing here? Yet it's so enticing, they continue to develop it, and they go back and forth, three steps forward, two steps back, that kind of thing. Stage two is crystallization, and that's when they lock into the other person in an intense sort of way. And sometimes in stage two, they do things such as rewriting history, where that they can't remember any good thing about their spouse, and only good things about their lover. And sometimes they'll vilify the spouse, like, well, you're evil, you're terrible, and and that's a way of justifying their leaving. There are all kinds of things that go on there. And so then accusing the spouse of things, etc., the kind of things that she just mentioned can all happen in stage two. She thought it was unusual that vacillation could occur even in stage two, and yet it's not unusual that people still have ups and downs. It's still kind of an emotional roller coaster. Stage three is what we call deterioration, and that's when limerence finally starts coming to an end. According to some pretty good research out there, that curve from beginning to end will last somewhere between three months and 48 months on average. Can it last shorter? Yeah, but that's pretty rare. Can it last longer? Yeah, but that's even more rare, or rarer, I guess I should say. Most of them will happen somewhere between three months and 48 months. So it could last just three. It could last as long as four years, as long as short as three months and as long as four years, I should say. And there's vacillation in stage three, where they start ending the relationship with the other person, but then move back up to stage two, back into stage three, back into stage two again, those three steps forward, two steps back. Now, as I already said earlier in this broadcast, if you mm, learn from these things, that's great, but please don't try to teach your spouse about it because they're going to deny it. There are other ways to deal with it, and that's what you can find out about it on our website at marriagehelper.com. Or if you wish, you can call and ask about this intensive three-day workshop we do for marriages in trouble. You can also ask about an online course that we have if you are the only one wanting to save the marriage, but your spouse doesn't. You see, the workshop is for both of you, even if one is extremely reluctant to come. And the online course is just for one of you if the other is not interested. You can find out about those things again at marriagehelper.com or by calling 615 472 1161. That's 615-472-1161. But now let's go back to this lady's call. She said that when he came home, he was a better parent than he was before. As a matter of fact, promoting the children, helping them in their careers, and became the son's best friend. And that he was nice and friendly. Now, understand, that's a big change for people who have been in limerence. If indeed, in stage two, they have been vilifying the spouse. In other words, saying all kinds of nasty and negative things about you. And saying all kinds of negative and nasty things to you. Which apparently had occurred, based on what we hear from her conversation there a moment ago. That he was like that when he was in stage two. But now he's being nice. He's being friendly. And so she has a problem in that, first of all, she's been asking her friend's advice. (laughs) I'm not trying to beat her up or you up, but let me just see if I can explain a thing there or two, if I may. You see, when you start talking about your marriage problems to your friends and or family, you typically aren't going to get good advice in return. You see, if you're dealing with somebody who is a true professional, he or she understands that what we do is to help you understand the principles. We also help you to understand how to apply principles in various situations, how to consider various scenarios, and then finally to make your own decision. You see, a true professional will not tell you what to do. Why? Because we don't have to live with your consequences. Now, if you're dealing with a counselor or therapist who is telling you what to do, 
You're right. By the way I'm explaining it, I would not view him or her as a true professional. I don't mean to be offensive, but people have no right to tell you what to do because they do not have to live with your consequences. Helping you think it through? Yes. Principles? Absolutely. All those things are extremely important. Helping you think through consequences? Yes. But not telling you what to do. So what happened when she talked to her friends? Apparently, she's telling them that he has not changed his cell phone number and that he has not changed his social media. And you did notice what she said. Oh, some of my friends are saying, well, that may just be pride on his part. You understand that there could be a whole lot of different motives for the man to do what he's doing. One, obviously, is that he's still somehow connected to that other woman. I mean, that's one thing you have to consider. It's a possibility, right? Another could be, I guess, potentially pride, although I don't really think that would be applicable or applicable, I should say, here. It may be. But you understand that there are so many different reasons that a person may do what he or she does that it's impossible for me to know another person's motives, for you to know another person's motives. (laughs) As a matter of fact, there are times when you don't even understand your own motives. Yeah, you know that. There are times when somebody would look at you and say, why did you do that? Or you've even asked yourself, why did I do that? And the only honest answer you had was, Uh, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. If we don't always even know our own motivations, we certainly can't always know the motivations of our spouses. And so when the friends are saying it may be because of pride, it may be because of this, they might as well make a list of 100 things long because it could be any of those. And here's the downside of trying to make that kind of assessment. If you decide you know why he is doing what he's doing, then you're going to react in a specific way, and it may be exactly the wrong way. The better thing to do is to ask, I mean really, ask, and hope that the other person will tell you the truth. Now, she said that she had conversations with him, and she would say, look, I need this. I I need you not to be on social media anymore. I need you to change your cell phone number. And that's a good first start. It really is. Now, here's something here. This is important, that if you're going to ask for those things, that you do it first by starting with what you need rather than what the other person should do. For example, if you say, okay, you must change your cell phone number, that sounds like a command or a demand, and people sometimes react very negatively to that because they feel controlled. So rather than addressing it to them, hey, you need to change this, it's a whole lot better to start from the frame of reference of you. I need you to change this. Now, if you're going to do that, explain why. Because I worry. I worry that that other person might try to be in contact with you. Notice, if you will, that I didn't say that you will try to contact that other person because that can sound accusatory. And again, your spouse can become very defensive. So rather than saying, I'm afraid you might contact her again, I'm going to turn that around by saying, I'm afraid she may try to contact you again. And if you've had the cell saying if you have the same cell phone number, then that's possible. That can happen. So you're not making it accusatory in any shape, fashion, or form. And then you explain the deep emotional needs you have. I want to trust you. I want to love you. I want this relationship to be the best it can be. Thank you for the fact that you've become the best dad you've ever been. Thank you for how kind and wonderful and nice you're being to me. And I realize it may sound like an imposition that I'm asking one more thing, but for me, for me, for my own peace of mind, for my own security, would you please change your cell phone number and would you please come off the social media? Now, it sounds like she may have used that approach. I'm not sure. You see, the call, and you can do the same thing if you wish, if you go to uh, SpeakPipe, That's on the internet, speak, S-P-E-A-K, pipe, V-I-P-E, speakpipe.com, and then slash Joe Beam, that's J-O-E-B-E-A-M, speakpipe slash Joe Beam, then you can record your question for me there as well. It is how I got this one. That's for uh, not able to ask her some of these questions in return. It was not a live phone call. It was recording she left. Now, if you do that, and I hope you do, notice that it'll ask for a name and an email. That's not because we're going to try to track you down. (laughs) Don't worry about that. 
It's because sometimes I feel that I really need to contact the person back directly to give an answer. And that's why we ask for the email in case I hear something and think, well, we need to talk or one of our folks needs to talk to you. Don't worry. You're not going to use it to try to make a sales call on you. It's as if we determine there's a need there that really needs to be dealt with right away. So if you want to leave questions like she did, please do. Now, I'm back to what I was just saying, which is I don't have a way to ask her if she did all those kinds of things. Notice that she moved on then to say, well, I have set boundaries before. You can actually go into our podcast and you can find one called The Definitive Guide to Boundaries. And in The Definitive Guide to Boundaries, it's about an hour and 15 minutes long where I'm talking about the difference in boundaries and criteria. Boundaries are things that must not happen. In other words, if you do this, there's a negative consequence that's going to occur. This is the negative consequence. A criteria is this is something that must happen. You need to do this. And if you don't do it, here's a negative consequence. And if you do it, here's a positive consequence. And that program goes into that in great detail that I don't have time to explain here. She set boundaries, she said, but it just seems to me, based on what she said, that she did not enforce the boundaries. Understand this. If you set a boundary or a criteria and you do not enforce that boundary or criteria, then it is useless. There can't be any mercy. There can't be any grace. Now, we do suggest tiered responses like don't do this. And if you do, here's a negative consequence. Now, if we get back together after that and you do it the second time, here's a more negative consequence. If we get back together after that and you do it a third time, here's an extreme negative consequence. That's what we mean by tiered consequences. But if you do not enforce consequences, then then nothing is going to happen. And when you try to set the next boundary, it's pretty well ignored. And so if this lady indeed has been setting boundaries but not enforcing them, setting one now... It's going to be very difficult because the history is, yeah, I know you set them, but you don't really do anything about them. Now, let's follow through to really the crux of her message here. She said, I'm the one who's vacillating. I'm the one who's pulling away because of the fact that he hasn't changed his cell phone number, because of the fact that he hasn't changed his social media. And I'm worried about that. And obviously, her friends are not helping By saying things like, well, it might be his pride, it may be this. And, of course, she's thinking, it may be because he's still involved with this woman. Even though he's being nice to me and good to our children, that's a possibility. And so all of these things are causing her to pull away from him. And she's the one who says, I'm not going to talk to you. It's going to be 100% or nothing. Now, I understand her motivations, I think. Again, as I said a few minutes ago, I don't know her exact motivations unless she tells me. But at least I understand her actions. Let me sit that way. Her actions being, if I'm not getting 100%, I'm, I'm pulling back. I don't trust you. I'm going to get hurt. And therefore, I'm vacillating right now about whether I want this thing to work or not because I'm afraid. I'm afraid that you're making a fool out of me by being here at home, being nice and kind, but maybe still being involved with her, and that's ripping me apart. I can't live like that. Now, if that's the case, if indeed that's what she's feeling, I certainly understand it. But the way she's going about it can be done better. Now, this is not to beat her up. And, and you know, lady, I hope that you're listening. Please don't hear me beating you up. I'm not doing that at all. And it's difficult when you're in the middle of these things to know all the right things to do. I mean, you've got so many emotions at play. So I'm not being negative about you. I just want to give you some ideas of how maybe to do this better. If indeed he is in contact still with the other person, which is a possibility. If that's happening, then he is sort of in what we call the valley. Now, the valley is when you don't feel like you've got to make any kind of change because things are going okay on both fronts. One front being you. He's living at home. He's being nice. He's polite. He's interacting with the children, becoming the son's best friend, etc. And if indeed he is still in some kind of contact with her, then if that front's going well, too, then the valley is I don't have to do anything. I don't have to make any kind of changes. And even if you were to say, which obviously you have, I need for you to change your cell phone number. He hasn't done it. I need for you to do things about social media and... He hasn't done it. 
And if you have done it the way I suggested earlier, where you have explained your heart, this is why I need this. I need this for my own peace of mind. I need this for my own security. Please do this for me. Not as a demand, not as a command, not as a control situation, but as, will you do this for me because I need it? Now try that first. If that works, fine. You don't have to worry about it any further. If it doesn't, then he may well be in the valley. And if he is in the valley, do you let him stay? Well, what I'm hearing from you is that you don't think so, that you're already pulling away from him and that things are going to start degenerating because of the fact that you've pulled away from him. My suggestion as I've said earlier, it's your decision. I don't make your decisions for you because I do not have to live with your consequences. So my suggestion is that you tolerate the valley as long as you can because it gives you interaction with your husband that can rebuild the relationship. No, I'm not saying it's okay or good if he's still involved with that other woman. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying, even if he's in the valley, if he's there with you and you're actually having conversations, actually interacting with each other, then you are, in a way at least, rebuilding this relationship. And that's why when people say, what do I do about the valley? I say, my suggestion is, if you can tolerate it for a while, please do so. Because at least now you're making things happen that may well turn out extremely well for your marriage and for you. But the valley can't go on forever. It'll destroy somebody, either you or him or your kids or somebody. You say, what do you mean? My recommendation or suggestion is stay in the valley unless it is doing damage to you or damage to your children or damage to him. Now, notice I didn't say if it's hurting you. There's a difference in feeling hurt and being damaged. Damage is when it's beginning to affect you in a very negative way, psychologically or spiritually or emotionally. It's, it's maybe even having a negative effect on you physically. And it's like, I can't live in this kind of stress anymore. It is ripping me to shreds. I can't handle this. Then that's harm. That's not hurt. That's harm. Hurting is like, okay, it hurts right now, but I'll be okay. Harm is like, it's actually doing damage to me. Remember, either physically, intellectually, emotionally, or spiritually, or if it's doing damage to your children, or if it were doing damage to your husband. If you're thinking, what? What does that mean? Well, suppose he starts drinking a lot because of the stress that goes with all these things or whatever else. If you see damage to him, and my suggestion then is, if it's doing damage to any of you, you, your children, or him, that that's when you draw that final boundary Oh, and by the way, in the situation where you've set boundaries before and then not enforced them, it's going to be difficult again. So this time I suggest you actually do it in writing. You write it down, you sit down with him and say, okay, this is what's going to have to happen. And if it doesn't, these are the consequences. These are the dates that it has to happen by. In your particular case, it's more of a criteria than a boundary. A criteria is something that has to happen. A boundary is something that must not happen. And the criteria you're setting is, I need you to change your cell phone number. Okay, that's a criteria. It's something you're saying must happen. And if you're going to do it, write it down and say, by this date, you have to have a new cell phone number. And then write under that the consequence. And if you do not, this is what I'm going to do. Now, understand that the consequence is not a consequence to him then it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's like the child saying, I'm going to hold my breath until my face turns blue. And mom or dad looks at the kid thinking, well, right after that, you're going to start breathing again. And so it's no, not going to affect me. So if that's what you want to do, go ahead, because it's not going to work. And so if you set a consequence, a negative consequence, it's got to be one that matters to the other person. Now, I'm not trying to give you the idea as to what that should be right here. I am asking you to go to that podcast, The Definitive Guide to Boundaries, that I've done. Joe Beam, that's who you're looking for, Mary's Radio, and find that Definitive Guide to Boundaries. It'll give you guidance there, at least the principles. Sometimes people contact us back and say, I need more than principles. Give me a specific thing I can do. <laughs> I don't know your situation. I don't have the right to make that decision for you. And sometimes you need to take these principles, think about it. If you're a religious person, Pray about it, work through them, come up with your own conclusions, 
But then you will have to enforce those boundaries. Now, it's up to you. If you're thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, I just realized that if I get him to change his cell phone number, he could give that number to the other woman. That's right, he could. Or if I got him to change his social media, he could still contact her in some other way that I wouldn't know about. And the answer to that is, you're right, that can happen. And so sometimes you need to ask yourself, hmm, is this boundary or criteria really what I want? Now, you can go ahead if it's that a good deal to you. And, and again, I strongly urge you that you speak it in terms of your own emotions. Let me explain to you why I need this. I'm asking you to please do this for me. And if he says no, or even if he says, I'll think about it, or even if he doesn't say a word, if he says anything other than yes, then I think it's time to say, help me understand what you're thinking. I need to understand your motivation. Don't say, some of my friends say it's because of your pride. (laughs) Don't do that. But you can say, can you help me understand what you're thinking and what you're feeling as to why you don't want to do this? And then listen. Hopefully, he'll give you some kind of an answer. If he does, don't attack. Don't argue. Try to understand. It's okay to ask questions to try to clarify. Like, okay, can I ask another question to help me understand that better? But if you come across as argumentative, if you come across as debating him, he's probably not going to tell you the truth. So what you want to do is to understand to the best of your ability. Help me understand, please. Now, finally, you say, okay, I'm vacillating. I get it. You're worried. I understand. Okay. If, though, you cease communication with him, then you really should go ahead and make that final boundary now, probably. Again, I can't tell you what to do. It's your decision. But probably go ahead and make that. Why? Because if you stop communicating with him and the other woman still is, then you're pushing him toward her. Now, if that's what you're ready to have happen, like, okay, it's going to be 100% or nothing. It's either her or it's me. Okay, then do that. But if you make that decision, make sure that you're going to live with that decision. Don't regret it later. Don't push him away if what you really want is for him to come closer. Are you understanding? If you're done, if you're saying, I can't live like this, I can't trust you, then go ahead. Push him away. See an attorney if you want to. File for divorce if that's what you wish to do. I mean, you've got all kinds of rights and powers here, all kinds of things that you can make happen. But make sure that's what you really want. It sounds, and again, I don't know your motivation. I can't read your heart or read your mind. But it sounds as if you really want this relationship to work. If so, then maybe you need to start communicating with him again and opening your heart to him to explain your hurt and your pain. But if you do, don't do it nonstop. Don't do it in an effort to try to make him feel guilty. Don't whine Don't plead. Don't do any of those things. But you can sit down with him, maybe on the front porch as the sun sets if you have a porch. Just the two of you, nobody else around, their cell phones off and say, I just need to explain my heart to you and where my hurt is right now. Then don't do it again the very next day and again the day after that. You can repeat it some, but be careful where it doesn't become a way of you're getting at him or where he finally just tries to avoid you because he doesn't want to hear the pain anymore. Hopefully you're understanding the principles that I'm teaching here. It is your choice. So if you want to pull away from him, go ahead. But to summarize everything I've just said, I suggest that you first explain your heart from your own terms, your own side. And if you think he's in the valley, but you can tolerate it for a while longer, do so while still communicating with him. If you're deciding that you're not going to communicate with him because you don't think he's 100% in, then pulling away from him is in all likelihood going to push him away. If that's what you're going to do, you might just be better off to go ahead and pull the plug on the thing rather than watching the slow pain of him moving away from you. You just run him away. If that's what you want, go ahead and do it. If it's not what you want, then may I suggest that you do the things I've been talking about so far. Now, Before I end this, she had another couple of questions. Let me play one more section from her, answer those questions. Another question is, is it really going to stop? Or what if this is the one? Who knows? 
And another one would be how to balance tough love versus being a safe place. I've tried boundaries before, but it, it, he always topped it. But this time I really feel numb, so I think I can stand on it. But I'm a little afraid if it, I will lose him forever. I mean, I've worked so hard for three years. Please help. Well, quite a bit of what you just asked, I've already answered. For example, about how to do the tough love. That's when I was talking about boundaries and criteria and those kinds of things. But let's talk about this other thing. I forgot to mention it earlier, but in an earlier cut from her, you notice he said he's involved with her again, but he didn't acknowledge it. But he went back to blame shifting and etc. That would indicate that whatever she found out about, she didn't have absolute proof that he's involved with the other person because he was able to deny it. But then she thinks, well, it's probably true because of the fact that when she confronted him about it, he blame shifted. In other words, don't don't blame me. It's not my fault. Or what are you doing? Those kinds of things. So let me mention a couple of really quick things about that there. I don't know how she found out that he might be involved with her again. But if indeed she did it by spying, you know, sneaking into his phone, hiding a GPS in his car, any of those kinds of things that people do, then understand that if you do those kinds of things, you know, stealing the passwords and looking at their Facebook pages, whatever it might be, if you do those kinds of things and then see some kind of evidence that your spouse is being involved with someone else or doing anything that they shouldn't be doing, and then you confront them with it, it's extremely rare for them to admit it. And almost always the response you're going to get is what this lady kind of indicated happened. Blame shifting is going to be about you. How dare you sneak into my cell phone? How dare you steal my password? How dare you? It won't be about their behaviors. It'll be how you violated their privacy and and what terrible thing you did. And so please hear that principle. (laughs) If you're thinking about doing those kinds of things, you may. It is obviously your privilege if you wish to do so. But be ready for your marriage to end because I have seen it on rare occasions lead to the other person confessing and straining up. But those are the rare occasions. If you're going to sneak behind them, those kinds of things, then it's probably going to be them reacting negatively toward you and things are going to go south. They're going to get worse in a hurry. And finally, she said, when is it ever going to end? It will. I'm not sure when it will, but it will. Sometimes I think we get so focused on the pain, the hurt, the fear, the worry that's right in front of us that we we can't see anything positive. For anybody out there who's ever been through a Lamaze class about the birth of children, if you've ever been in that room, either as the mother delivering the child or as the father being the mother's coach, then you understand that when you start focusing too close in on yourself, then the pain becomes overbearing and overwhelming. And part of what Lamas teaches you is to look beyond that. Well, I can't remember exactly how it's done. It's been a long time since my last baby was born. (laughs) But I know that you can't just focus up close because it will just intensify the pain. Look to the future. You say, what future? Okay, here. If you do the right things, and we'll be glad to teach you the right things. I mentioned earlier this online course that we have. It's called Save My Marriage. It's designed for the one person because because at this point, the other spouse doesn't really want to save the marriage. And I truly hope you look into that. It's relatively relatively inexpensive and you get lifetime access to it. It has 10 weeks of teaching. And then we do some coaching calls as well. And all of this is done online. The coaching calls can also, you can come into that by your smartphones, but it can show you. And one thing we say about that is if anything works, this will. If anything works, this will. Again, you can find out about that on marriagehelper.com or you can call 615-472-1161. Now, if you're thinking about, you just said, if, if, if anything works, that's correct. I am not going to lie to you and guarantee you that it absolutely will. I get really angry when I see those things on the Internet where people make it, well, sometimes even state it rather than imply it. You do my stuff and it will save your marriage. Well, I can tell you if you do what we teach, if anything works, this will work. I can tell you that. And we have a ton of success stories, tons of success stories. And we know 
that if a couple comes to our intensive three-day workshop, even if one spouse does not want to be there, even if that spouse came only to get a better deal in the divorce, three out of four of those couples turn it around and save their marriages. So we feel good about our odds. But understand, I'm not promising you this is going to be the absolute be-all, end-all. Now, if you're thinking, okay, but what if it doesn't work? Then hear me. Please hear me. It's not the end of the world. Oh, yes, we want to help you save your marriage. That's why Marriage Helper exists. That's one of our main purposes. We'll hurt with you if that marriage ends. But if you learn how to do the right things in a relationship, if, God forbid, your marriage does come to an end, you're going to be so much better equipped to have an amazing relationship in the future. We hope and pray it is with your husband or wife that you have now that you guys can fix this. Make it better. Make it better than it was before. But if not, look to that future. Don't just focus on the pain in front of you. When will it ever end? I can't give you the month. I can't give you the week. I can't give you the day. But I'm telling you, when you do the right things, ultimately, it works out to your advantage. Please hang on to that hope. Please. Hey, send me your questions on speakpipe.com slash Joe Beam. I would love to hear them. That's J-O-E-B-E-A-M, speakpipe.com slash Joe Beam. And we'll be answering those in these podcasts as best we can. Thank you for your time.